Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2.30 p.m. session in the Research and Education Track. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC14. This hour, we're happy to introduce a terrific session called Studying Economics in the Virtual World, from the lab to the class. Our speaker today is Kevin McCabe. Kevin uses experiments to study the behavior of economic systems that range from the neural systems of the brain to the economic systems of virtual worlds. He interprets economic systems broadly to include the social, political, and economic interactions that lead to outcomes that affect our world. Since 2006, he has been developing economic experiments and data processing pipelines on virtual world platforms. Welcome, everyone. Let's begin the session. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for showing up. Um, to, today, I want to talk uh, about the work we're doing uh, in virtual worlds to do research in economics and to basically study uh, uh, ba basically be able to study So, so what? So what we'll do is uh, start with just a little background on me. Um, basically, uh, I'm an experimental economist who studies uh, uh, economics from the viewpoint of the laboratory. That is, uh, how can we set up and design experiments to test economic theories? and to uh, build economic systems. My original uh, research was on economic systems design, which is how do you build auctions systems to uh, distribute goods and services? How do you build contracting systems, property rights systems, and so on? I did that for about the first 10 years of my life, and then uh, the, the economic systems design approach views the institution that people engage in as a computational device that takes the messages that people send it and turn it into outcomes that they're interested in. The, uh, as, we, as we moved on from economic systems design, I began to realize that uh, institutions were being governed by people and that it became important to understand the personal exchange that people were engaged in. And so we, uh, we moved much more into the question of how do people trust each other? How do they negotiate with each other? How do they decide on rules of contact that, uh, that, that jointly affect each other and so on? Um, that led us to kind of the study of neuroeconomics, which is how does, how does the brain make these decisions? That is, how do we engage in social interaction and how do we uh, um, uh, make economic decisions? Uh, as, I, as I was doing the neuroeconomics research, it, it began to dawn on me that uh, that that basically the the brain is is designed to interact in a fluid world, and when we when we do an experiment, we often for control and for uh, uh, signal to to noise considerations, we we end up creating really simple designs. Uh, and of course, if you get a simple enough design, you're gonna end up getting 
a, a theory that will explain your data uh, with enough work. And, and the question is, does that theory uh, uh, work in the real world? Uh, well, about 10 years ago, uh, I had the chance to meet up with uh, John Lester, who is giving a talk at uh, Harvard, and we got to talking about virtual worlds. And, and it, it became obvious to me that it would be interesting to know if, if the theories that we were studying and getting evidence for in controlled laboratory experiments would be robust to more general uh, social and economic interactions. And it was at that point that, that the virtual world became a, a place to consider as an experimental platform. So to date, we've done eight research experiments and uh, uh, sort of it represents a major portion of our research program. But I think, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about one example of research design, but I think what to me is interesting is we've been able to leverage the research so that um, we can start doing demonstration experiments in OpenSim. And these demonstration experiments allow us to take our research back into the classroom. This is, this is something that has been going on in experimental economics for quite some time now. Uh, but I think what's new in this, in this bringing the research uh, into the classroom is that not only can students participate in experiments, but they can also build their own economic systems. And this kind of show, shared social learning is, is really been what I think is an amazing part of the OpenSIM uh, uh, research and teaching we do. So let me talk a little bit about one experiment that, that we've already done. This one was actually run in Second Life. Uh, since then, we've moved completely to Open Simulator, but um, it was our, our first experiment, an attempt to study collective dilemma problems in, in uh, virtual worlds. So in a virtual world, uh, or in a, a ex economic setting, a, a typical economic problem is what uh, Eleanor Ostrom calls uh, the commons problem. Uh, the commons problem is a resource under common control. And because it's under con common control, it can often result in individual free riding behavior. Uh, now, what do we mean by free riding? Well, it's basically when individuals don't do their fair share of the work. Um, so, Ostrom got the Nobel Prize in economics, actually, for, for studying these systems in the field and the laboratory. And there's been a lot of research done. Uh, and the, the question she asked is, even though this is a dilemma problem, much similar to Kay's work on the Prisoner's Dilemma game that maybe a lot of people have seen already, uh, this is a problem of, of self or group governance. How do, how do groups govern each other? How do we maintain self-control and not engage in free writing behavior so we can cooperate? So, so we decided to build a, uh, a region um, that we call Hurricane Island. Now on Hurricane Island, we have 12 people living in houses around the island. Uh, the island is subject to periodic storms. So when a, when a storm comes through, it can damage your house. Now why do you care about that? Well, if you're in your house, you can earn income. 
And the more damage your house is, the less income you'll earn. So the amount of earnings you make is proportional to the amount of damage your house has. Now, you can defend your house from storms locally at your own house, and you can repair your house after it's been damaged, but those are both costly exercises and take time and money. So alternatively, we set up these, uh, if you look on the right here, these uh, self-defense stations where, or island defense stations where basically people could go to the island defense station and if they were there, they could protect the whole island from the storm. So they were offering this public good uh, as opposed to just trying to um, uh, defend their own house. Now, if we look at the next slide, what we see is a character of the island uh, with eight houses on it that have been, and you'll see that there's two defense stations here, one at N1 called North One and one at N3. Those defense stations only protect people below the defense station. So if you're, if you're defending at N1, you protect everybody. But if you're defending at N3, you only de you're only defending purple, red, blue, and green. So the implication of that is that the people below N3 have a threat point. They could say, look, we're only going to defend at N3. Uh, and if we do that, if you're a yellow, brown, orange, or teal, you're going to have to protect us at N1. So if they protect us at N1, though, we don't have to protect at N3. So there's kind of an interesting game theory equilibrium here where basically we would predict that brown, yellow, teal, and orange will have to do the defending while purple, red, blue, and green will not. Now what we find out, which is interesting, is that if we make the environment not very complex, we can basically uh, show that people don't follow the game theoretic prescription. That is, they, they learn to take turns defending at N1 and everybody takes a turn and they all cooperate. But if we, but if we add complexity to the situation, what we find is that the game theory becomes more and more predictive. So this was the first example we had of how virtual worlds give us an experimental platform where we can basically see that the theory works in more complex environments. And so if we had just always been studying this in a very simple environment, we would have missed, we would have missed this uh, observation. I, I just thought it would be interesting to uh, show people what a chat snippet looks like for a um, uh, one of the less successful, more complex environments. This is an environment where storms can come from both the north and the east, uh, and they have to they don't know which direction the storm's coming from. And they have to coordinate who's going to defend northern storms and who's going to defend eastern storms, et cetera. Uh, what we find is that successful groups uh, in the language are showing very successful coordination strategies. That is, they, they work out and agree beforehand to who's going to cover when. Uh, and then there's usually somebody playing the coordinator role who coordinates this interaction uh, but if they fail, what happens is uh, they don't agree to the plan, and this was the case with this group, and the storm came in, and the people that were supposed to defend weren't defending. Uh, you'll notice the conversation there by Green Gardner saying, look, uh, 
maybe we should go to our subgame perfect solution. Maybe we should basically just defend at N3 and E3 and not try to cooperate as much. Um, at the same time, at the same time, they're, they're figuring out who the culprit is. So if you look on this next slide, they've gotten to the second storm and all of a sudden uh, they've realized that it's orange uh, and teal that were supposed to be a team that were working on that defense station. It turned out teal showed up, but orange never did. And through the conversation, they're starting to identify who the culprit is. Later on, this will turn into uh, verbal punishment, and then later on into uh, kind of more more ostracization of orange because they failed to do their their job. Now, what I, what I think I want to do is turn now to. Uh, how we've been teaching in Second Life. So this is our uh, I Free Summer Workshop program. This is uh, for high school students. So we, we bring in 16 students, put them into teams of four, and have them work for a full week on building a virtual world experiment. Um, before they come in for eight weeks prior, we have summer interns who are undergraduates from around the country who come in and spend an eight-week summer internship program with us. Uh, the interns learn how to do research in virtual worlds uh, and then later on act as mentors in the summer school program. The, the workshop is funded by um, IFRI, which is the International Foundation for Research and Experimental Economics. And uh, the guy who started IFRI was Vernon Smith, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for his work in experimental economics. Uh, and he's been a big supporter of the open sim education efforts in economics. Uh, so far, we've been able to run the workshop for four years. We have a, we've had a total of 72 students uh, and 16 teams work on projects. Uh, we basically emphasize learning by doing. Uh, the way it works a typical day, the students start out by being in an experiment that illustrates an economic concept. Uh, they then get together with uh, each other and myself and discuss the experiment and the economics behind the experiment. Uh, in the afternoon, they, they go out and design and build an experiment in OpenSim. And lately, we've been, the last year, we've run the OpenSim in Kitely. Um, so students... Uh, uh, build an experiment. They actually, on the last day, run the experiment with family and friends. Uh, each day, they work on presentations that they're going to make at the end of the five days. Uh, and they write up a paper explaining what their experiment's about and what economic concept they're studying. This is the 2014 uh, group. Uh, they're local area high schools from the Northern Virginia area. We, we usually get representatives from about 12 high schools. Uh, we require that they've already taken AP Computer Science and before they're allowed to uh, before they're allowed to um, uh, get into the workshop they have to complete about an eight-hour uh, instructional, self-paced instructional uh, tour through our teaching islands on Kitely, uh, where they learn basic programming in open sim practices and um, uh, building practices. So these are these are. Uh, 
highly qualified students on average. Um, what I thought I would do is just take you through a few slides showing you their typical day. So uh, in the morning, they're uh, participating in an experiment. Uh, we, so we've got 16 subjects uh, running through an experiment uh, at this stage. Uh, it takes them about an hour and a half to read instructions and then do the experiment. On the, when their experiment's over, we're able to stream the data out of Kitely to a server, and then we basically uh, use R to create uh, graphical representations of their data. Uh, once we have their data available, then we can talk to them about what the experiment was about, what they were doing in their experiment, and um, you know, sort of get them to tell us what their strategy was, what they were learning during the experiment, and to talk to each other about, well, how could you extend this to study other things and, and so on. So the, the discussion lasts about an hour. Now, after lunch, uh, they're going to uh, learn some more advanced programming in LSL. At the front of my room, the room there is my graduate student, Peter Twig, who's been doing this with us all four years and is just about ready to go on the market. So I'm going to miss him dearly. But uh, anyway, the, uh, he's in charge of the instructional component, uh, getting them up to speed. The mentors are in the room with them and are there to help them if they have questions, but not to help them actually complete their project. Now, when they, once they get their project, the, the students start planning out on paper uh, what they're going to do in the virtual world. And then in the afternoons, they spend all of their time building, basically. Uh, they do have a short meeting with me to talk about uh, how things are coming along and stuff like that. But they're mostly in the room, and they're mostly working uh, as teams to build their experiment. Um, and here you just, you, if you go into that room, you just see this buzz as they're uh, talking about what they're doing and programming in world and building the objects they need. And to me, it's totally amazing because uh, this, is, this is the island we give them to start with. It's literally a blank slate. Uh, and what you, what you see is uh, the next few slides, I'm just going to show you one of the team's builds in the last year, last summer. Uh, so here's one of the students is uh, building an object that's going to end up being the master object for coordinating uh, the message passing between a number of objects in the experiment. And they decided to make the master object the sun. So they're working on the sun right now, uh, getting code in and so on. Uh, at the same time, another student is building some of the interaction elements uh, for the experiment. So the, there's, there's going to be objects that people have to touch and interact with in order to make decisions in the experiment. And they're, they're just starting to build the basic objects. Uh, we find that... Um, on the scripting side, students uh, kind of break down into who's most comfortable with scripting. So usually there's about two people on each team 
that are doing most of the scripting, although everybody does a little bit of scripting, but usually two people do most of the scripting. Uh, we usually get one person who um, is uh, kind of kind of just likes texturing the island, likes to see uh, a visual thinker and likes to see, think about how, what the island's going to look like, and they start building, and they get help from other people as they need it. Now, you, here on this slide, you, you can see their their experiment is starting to take shape, and they've uh, uh, they're starting to get objects built on it. They've got uh, pieces terraformed. Um, usually, right around now, the other teams start visiting uh, each other's regions and commenting on what's going on and asking questions. Um, so it's, it's kind of fun to watch that interaction take place too. Uh, now here's the, here's the final, uh, version of their experiment. So it turned out to be a public goods game and they've, uh, got private and public resources that people can decide what to invest in. And, uh, this one completely finished. They were able to run their parents through it and, and basically show them the public goods problem, uh, you know, running in, in, in real, well, in open sim life. Um, and then in front of their parents and friends, they do a final presentation explaining both the technical side of their project and the um, and the um, economics of their project. Um, they they haven't collected much data yet, but they usually have a little bit of data to show and and so on. So, you know, we. Um, We've got funding for another year, so we'll be doing this project uh, for at least one more year. We've got, we've been getting uh, National Science Foundation funding for uh, the research. Uh, we continue to go strong there. I think, you know, in, in closing, uh, before I finish, to me, one of the most important things that's been going on here is the research is funding the education. That is the building, the tools we build, the uh, environments we build and so on are paid for by grants and that allows us to invest the time and money in it. Uh, then uh, um, the teaching benefits because we're able to take the research experiments and then reintroduce them as demonstration experiments. Um, so I'm going to stop there and say thank you and check out uh, local chat to see if you have any questions. Somebody asks, is it true that micro, uh, macroeconomics is dead? Um, uh, it, interestingly enough, uh, macroeconomics will never die, right? But uh, there's, a, there's an economic version of macro called the microeconomic foundations of macro, which is what most macroeconomists do. In fact, as far as I can tell, the large game designers are starting to... Um, realize that they need that kind of macroeconomic 
thinking in their games. Uh, somebody asked to, uh, uh, do you sometimes need outside participants in your studies? So far, we haven't. Uh, we've, we've run largely in-house. When we do teaching, it's a kind of a blended environment, classroom, uh, but we're, we're in the classroom. When we do research, we still do it in our laboratory, largely because I'm worried about the experimenter control issues. But I think after the work we've done that we're starting to get comfortable with the idea that we could, in fact, um, um, uh, recruit people from Mechanical Turk or um, uh, Facebook uh, to be in our Kiteley experiments. And I think that would be a really interesting direction to go. Uh, another question I got was, do you get a sense that the students will continue to use virtual environments in their future work, both academic and non-academic? That's a good question. It's a little hard to tell. We, we do a ex post questionnaire with the high school students, uh, asking them, you know, did they, how interesting they found it. They, they across the board, give the the experience an excellent, uh, and we do get about 25% that say this this is something they they would be interested in pursuing if in fact uh, th they could find a supportive place and so on that's doing it. Um, so. So I, I do think so. We um, we've had um, three high school students now come back and be uh, summer scholars. Uh, so come back for the summer to work with us, and they the our summer scholars uh, and the high school students both tend to end up at really good. Uh, undergraduate and graduate schools, and um, there. And, and they stay in touch. Um, I, I don't think they get that much opportunity to do virtual worlds in their uh, current research. It looks like that may be it for questions. Well, thank you, Kevin, for a terrific presentation. This session closes out the research and education track presentations, and we're at the end of the second annual Open Simulator Community Conference 2014. Following the conference program, all staff and volunteers are invited to the stage at the Keynote One region for pictures and a celebration, and the audience is welcome to join the festivities on your assigned Keynote region. 
In addition, there are s still three social events after the conference to keep the excitement going. At 3.30 p.m. Pacific, Stephen Zoot Fly will be hosting an Educators Birds of a Feather meeting on the Avicon grid to discuss how to encourage more educators to use Open Simulator. Then at 5 p.m., the Sina Wisdom Seeker hosts a continuation of the Quest for the Galaxy Language session on the Second Life grid in the Inspiration Island region. Finally, the last social event of the conference is at 7 p.m. Pacific on the Pirates Atoll grid. Dance on the Sunset Beach at Pirates Atoll to the ethereal sounds of Dream Pop and Indie Beat. A great time to unwind and socialize after the conference. A tremendous thank you to all of our speakers, sponsors, crowd funders, volunteers, and the hundreds of attendees who braved a host of technical challenges to make this conference a success. Have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to seeing you next year at the Open Simulator Community Conference 2015.